Roosevelt, and I speak of uh, Theodore, of course, uh, and Wilson uh, openly boasted that they were not obliged to follow the words of the Constitution, that as president, they could make changes on their own. I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Judge Andrew Napolitano, whose latest book is Theodore and Woodrow, How Two American Presidents Destroyed Constitutional Freedom. Judge, thanks for talking with Pleasure us. Pleasure to be here, Nick. In previous books, uh, you, things like Lies the Government Told You, uh, It is Dangerous to Be Right When the Government is Wrong, and uh, Dred Scott's Revenge, you looked at different eras of American history and the way that uh, freedom was kind of eviscerated by you know, various politicians and powers that be. Now you're talking about Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and the progressive era. Why does the progressive era matter so much when we're looking at shrinking of liberty? The uh, radical change in the relationship of the federal government to individual Americans was ratcheted up greatly in the progressive era. If, if we can go back a little bit, there was no relationship between the federal government and individual Americans until after the Civil War. And then the military occupation of half the country known in some quarters as Reconstruction, uh, resulted in a direct personal relationship between the federal government and individuals. During Reconstruction, for example, you couldn't go to the post office without permission from, uh, from the military and a lot of other draconian measures. You couldn't ex build a house or expand your house or repair your house if General was, Sherman burnt it down yeah. without permission from the federal and government. that was in the uh, former Confederate states? Yes, uh, yeah. yes. Now, in the progressive era, we find uh, a Republican and a Democrat collaborating together, even though um, they barely met and didn't really like each other. The changes in that time period are radical, and they all center around one thing, and that is the Constitution somehow empowers the federal government to right any wrong, regulate any behavior, and tax any event. Whether it's articulated in the Constitution, whether it can be extrapolated from the words of the Constitution or not. Roosevelt, and I speak of uh, Theodore, of course, uh, and Wilson uh, openly boasted that they were not obliged to follow the words of the Constitution, that as president, they could make changes on their own. So you have two presidents who believe, this is a radical difference, Nick, from all of their predecessors, even Lincoln, that they can, from the White House, order and direct changes which will affect the lives of every American. Roosevelt started the FBI on his own, without any budgetary appropriation or legislation from the Congress. Roosevelt bought vast swaths of, of, federal, of, of private uh, property or stole the property from the states because he didn't pay the states for it and claimed this is now uh, a federal land. He did all this without the uh, consent uh, or legislation uh, from the Congress. So Woodrow Wilson arrested people because of what they said about the World War I, not what they did about World War I, and his behavior was never checked. And they claimed they got the power to do this from their position as the head of a state, the head of a country, irrespective of the limiting factors in the Constitution. Right, and one of the, I mean, the main theme of the book is that we either have a Constitution that is the law of the land or we don't. Right. And obviously the answer from Roosevelt and Wilson were, yeah, well, you know, I'm the law. Right. So Roosevelt and Wilson, I mean, they're different parties. They come from different regions of the country uh, when regions, uh, regional differences were much stronger. Right. You went to Woodrow Wilson, the college that he was president of. Right. He was a rabid racist. Yes. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was a racialist in other ways. He believed in the supremacy of the so-called white races, which would preclude either. We, we would not have had membership in his understanding of the white race. Correct, correct. I would not have been admitted to Princeton if he were still president of it. <laughs> so where was their similar worldview coming from? Because they, you know, I, and, and discuss the role of how they viewed elites. They thought that they could uplift uh, people's lives by telling them how to live their lives. So these two uh, presidents and the government under them um, stole freedom of choice from individuals, poor as well as wealthy. Uh, and in return uh, gave them uh, a set of values and parameters in which they could live their lives, believing that this would uplift everybody's lives. Are they, are they wrong about that? I mean, just on an empirical basis, because there were rapid uh, increases in material uh, circumstances for people. Certain types of diseases were eradicated. Um, there was great material prosperity in the progressive era. 
The argument of the book is it would have been vastly greater mm -hmm. had the federal government not uh, interfered. Neither of them would recognize the truism that government doesn't create wealth, it only consumes mm -hmm. it. They believed that by redistributing wealth, they could spread the wealth. Mm -hmm. Of course, as we know from history, we are, as we tape this two days after uh, the re-election of Barack Obama to the White House, as we know from history, the redistribution of wealth creates dependence on the people to whom it is redistributed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't incentivize them to create their own wealth. I've argued that the uh, re-election of the president was in large measure due to the fact that nearly half the country receives most of its subsistence from the other half. Sort of Jefferson and Hamilton, the only thing they agreed on in public as far as we know. When the voters recognize that the public treasury has become a public trough, mm -hmm. they will only send to Washington people who will promise to give them as much of the pie as they can. This began under Wilson. Uh, and Roosevelt. Now it's an odd combination. Roosevelt was born with a spoon in his mouth. Wilson was born to a middle class uh, family. But Wilson rose to, uh, to wealth and personal prosperity uh, through academia. Roosevelt, who never really worked the way you and I did, experienced wealth and enjoyed wealth that came uh, from his family. And then the two of them sought political power. Neither of them ever had, excuse the phrase, to get their fingernails dirty. Right. Neither of them ever experienced um, participation in the risk of their own personal wealth in order to get a return uh, on that investment. One was coddled by academia, the other was coddled by his own family. And both would meet at about the same time in the same place, which is the White House. Who were other contemporaries of Roosevelt and Wilson who said, no, this is absolutely the wrong way well, to well, well, govern? Well, William Howard Taft is a real uh, enigma hmm. because his, his presidency uh, is filled with language and vetoes of legislation, uh, which shows in his own mind a fidelity to the Constitution. Um, and then, of course, William Howard Taft has the misfortune of running against um, Woodrow Wilson, right. where Teddy is running as a third party candidate because the Republicans rejected him. Right. And at this point, Taft, who had been a protege of Roosevelt, they're now bitter enemies. They are, they yeah. are bitter enemies, absolutely. Uh, Roosevelt believes that the presidency should be his. Taft believes that uh, Roosevelt should stay uh, in, in retirement. And Taft, of course, uh, was not only Roosevelt's buddy, but he worked for him. So you have Roosevelt, who's now clearly going to take most of his votes away from Taft, facilitating the election of someone he claims to dislike even more, mm -hmm. though on paper, and in reality agrees right. with him, Woodrow Wilson. So the question is, because Taft ends up in a very nice position after all this, he's booted out of the White House. Where does he end up? As the Chief Justice of the United States which is tremendous power because it's lifetime power. Was this a deal? Did he know he was going to get the chief justiceship when he sort of sacrificed his presidency so that TR could make the comeback effort and Wilson could get the presidency? One will never know. It is Wilson, of course, who makes Taft the chief justice. And then as the chief justice, he has this metamorphosis. He starts out as a small government libertarian and ends up justifying through the typical circuitous route that the courts have done this for generations, all the big government um, uh, legislation uh, that the Congress enacted. In, in terms of those who would resist the progressive era, you have a cadre of members of the House of Representatives and senators from the Midwest, not from the two coasts, because progressivism is a hotbed in California, right. and clearly it is in the East Coast and it is in, in Chicago, almost like the hotbeds of liberal Democrats today. Right. But you have a, a cadre of members of Congress from both parties and in both houses from the Midwest who meekly resist to this, and then it becomes obvious to them. The longer they're there, the longer they see. Mm -hmm. uh, what does dependency build? Votes. And so they, they go on board to the point where today, Mitt Romney, supposedly faithful to the Constitution, can run for president saying, I'm going to maintain Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Amtrak, the post office, the long list of crazy entitlements that have uh, bankrupted and us. And it's, it's something like 49% of Americans live in households that get direct money from the government. Right. So this is the dependency. The, well, the tipping point is 50. I mean, yeah. once, once there are more of them than us, they will use the tools of the government, the legal tools of the government, to, to curb our liberty and extract wealth from us. I mean, to hear the president mock and belittle, for example, David and Charles Koch, mm -hmm. each worth about $35 billion, forgetting that together 
they employ several hundred thousand human beings. What does he want them to do? Take that 35 billion, it's 70 billion combined, and put it in a shoebox and all those people will be out of, out of work and the government can take whatever it wants from the shoebox and give it away to those people who used to earn nice incomes themselves? You see, this is a problem. What is the theory of social change? In your previous book, you were getting, it seemed more and more radical of saying, you know, there are times where we just have to say no to the government and you were almost implying, you know, if not violent revolution, a refusal, uh, a kind of Thoreau-like refusal uh, to, to go along and to throw your body on the machine. Well, how, do we, how do we change things or well, how do you, you think you can't do? really throw your body on the machine when the machine has the majority behind it. I mean, we know, for example, sometimes the machine doesn't have the majority behind it. Uh, two days ago, we witnessed in uh, Colorado, for example, the, a referendum on the ballot which legalized the possession of marijuana by adults for all purposes. This was after the legislature had defeated it. Mm -hmm. So this is literally the people going above the government they have supposedly elected to, to serve them, to work for them. So s that's one way you can get around the machine. But at the same day this happened, Barack Obama amassed maybe 44 or 45 percent of the electorate behind his big government, the, the Constitution doesn't matter, I can give away all the wealth that I can get my hands on. So at some point this will collapse. At some point we'll be like Greece. Great portion of the populace dependent on the government and the government unable to borrow money and it knows it can't print anymore because you need a wheelbarrow to buy a loaf of bread like right. the Weimar Republic. Where does that lead to? That leads either to dictatorship or to violence. And that will prove the wisdom. I'm not calling for a revolution. I don't want to get arrested by the feds as soon as I leave this room. <laughs> but that will lead, right. that, that proves Jefferson's statement that the blood of patriots has to be sprinkled on the tree of revolution. He said once in every yeah. generation, we haven't had anything yeah. like this since the Civil War. What are the ways to turn things around before it gets to, uh, you know, before we tell everybody to go long and well, the, the Colorado example may be beneficial in unanticipated ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, it may demonstrate, and, and I'm not a crusader for marijuana. I am a crusader for personal freedom. Mm -hmm. I am a crusader for I can do what I want with my own body. Right. I'm not talking about abortion because I believe that's another body inside yeah. a woman's, but right. that's another subject for later if you wish. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the marijuana one is a great example because the unforeseen consequence here, aside from telling the feds to take a hike, mm -hmm. aside from the people of Colorado telling their own state government to take a hike, is the economic consequence. If Colorado succeeds, marijuana will be far less expensive in Colorado than it is today. That will dry up the demand for marijuana from the Mexican cartels. So this might be an experiment that would open up the eyes of governments in other states. Stated differently, if you were to take a poll amongst various interest groups in America, who wants to legalize marijuana? I dare say the group that most wants to do it, law enforcement because they realize it's, they're battling against the tide. This is against human nature. People are ultimately going to put in their bodies what they want. This is a waste of their resources. They're far better catching a bank robber than they are catching a, a user uh, of marijuana. So social experiments at the state level may open up the eyes of the Victorian phonies and nanny staters uh, around the country to realize that freedom produces more uh, wealth and prosperity and happiness than government control does. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Your most recent book is Theodore and Woodrow, How Two American Presidents Destroyed Constitutional Freedom. I hope your book helps restore some constitutional freedom. Always a pleasure, Thank Nick. You. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie. Now, in the progressive era, we find uh, a Republican and a Democrat collaborating together, even though um, they barely met and didn't really like each other. The changes in that time period are radical, and they all center around one thing, and that is the Constitution somehow empowers the federal government to right any wrong, regulate any behavior, and tax any event, whether it's articulated in the Constitution, whether it can be extrapolated from the words of the Constitution or not. Roosevelt, and I speak of uh, Theodore, of course, uh, and Wilson a little bit, there was no relationship between the federal government and individual Americans until after the Civil War. And then the military occupation of half the country, known in some quarters as Reconstruction, 
uh, resulted in a direct personal relationship between the federal government and individuals. During Reconstruction, for example, you couldn't go to the post office without permission from uh, from the military and a lot of other draconian measures. You couldn't ex build a house or expand your house or repair your house if General was, Sherman burnt it down yeah. without permission from the federal and government. that was in the uh, former Confederate states? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you, things like lies the government told you, uh, it is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong, and uh, Dred Scott's revenge. You looked at different eras of American history and the way that uh, freedom was kind of eviscerated by you know various politicians and powers that be. Now you're talking about Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and the progressive era. Why does the progressive era matter so much when we're looking at shrinking of liberty? The uh, radical change in the relationship of the federal government to individual Americans was ratcheted up greatly in the progressive era. If, if we can go back a little, uh, openly boasted that they were not obliged to follow the words of the Constitution, that as president, they could make changes on their own. So you have two presidents who believe, this is a radical difference, Nick, from all of their predecessors, even Lincoln, that they can, from the White House, order and direct changes which will affect the lives of every American. Roosevelt started the FBI on his own, without any budgetary appropriation or legislation from the Congress. Roosevelt bought, Roosevelt, and I speak of uh, Theodore, of course, uh, and Wilson uh, openly boasted that they were not obliged to follow the words of the Constitution, that as president, they could make changes on their own. I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Judge Andrew Napolitano, whose latest book is Theodore and Woodrow, How Two American Presidents Destroyed Constitutional Freedom. Judge, thanks for talking with Pleasure us. Pleasure to be here, Nick. In previous books... Uh